Okay. Is this microphone? Can everyone hear me all right? Is this microphone working? Hello, hello. Yeah, good. Ah, here we go. We're rolling. Hello. How do? Yeah, enjoying the breakfast? Yeah, I think we just timed it right, didn't we? Getting in with the breakfast before all the croissants ran out and all that lot. Everyone else is going to be missing out. Uh, thank you for coming to this particular part of the day. I'm kind of here, I suppose, to... I'm, I, I think I'm the warm-up act, essentially. I'm here to kind of bring you up to speed on a few things. And what I thought I would do, really, is try and bring you up to speed on things so that when we go into the other room, you've already got a lot of context and you've already got a lot of information that you can use to kind of just kick on with rather than, you know, uh, being a bit lost. Who is... Out of everyone here, who is kind of already familiar with voice technology or voice kind of AI conversational stuff? Yeah? Okay, that's good then. Uh, so have you, have you kind of built stuff? Or are you kind of just keenly interested? We use it. You use it? When built, yeah. Oh, okay. So where, where do you use it? The BBC. Ah, fantastic. Wicked. Okay. Some slides from the BBC on here, actually, believe it or not. Um, what about everyone else? Is anyone else... Either using it or has anyone else built anything yet? <coughs> oh, the Okado skill. Ah, wicked, cool, fantastic. Okay, so there's some experience in here then. So, some of this stuff you might already be aware of then. So, let me know whether or not I'm, I'm kind of going over stuff that you're already familiar with and we'll move on. So, what I've got is <coughs> some data in terms of adoption and usage and stuff like that to try and frame where we are currently in terms of adoption and usage. Some things there around how to be thinking about it as a, as a brand and how to kind of, you know, what is voice and what does it mean and how can we go, how can we think about it? Uh, and then there's some use cases and some interesting sort of like case studies and examples and stuff like that. And hopefully by the time we kind of leave here, we'll have an understanding of where the industry is, where the users are and what kind of stuff is going on. And hopefully that'll put the whole day in some context for you. So I'm Ken Sims, I'm the uh, founder of VUX World. We're a consultancy and a mostly known for our podcast. So every week we interview people from the voice space and we cover uh, anything that, that is involved in creating a voice user experience from strategy to design to development. And really what we want to do and what we do every week is we help people create world-class voice experiences by speaking to the industry leaders and pioneers of this stuff. So as myself, I'm Kane Sims, uh, and Dustin Coates is our co-founder, and yeah, that's kind of what we're mostly known for. I'm just wondering how I'm going to get through these slides. Ah, okay. <laughs> I have a clicker. I'm assuming it works. There you go. So yeah, the podcast is, is on all kind of podcast places if you want to go and check it out. Um, so let's begin by just showing a little bit about the current device install base. So these are the kind of top four digital assistants that exist, Cortana, uh, Siri, Google Assistant, and obviously Alexa. So although Alexa is grabbing the vast majority of the headlines and actually does own most of the market share of usage, uh, or smart, certainly in smart speakers, in terms of the actual assistants being on, on devices in general, Google is on over a billion devices. Obviously, it's got the Android ecosystem. Every Android phone has access to Google Assistant. But the new ones even have a specific button on the side that you can just get straight to it. Apple, obviously, it's on all of the iPhones, or most of the iPhones. Uh, and then Cortana is on over 400 million laptops and the four or five Windows phones that are still around. Uh, and then Alexa, obviously, that's more or less just smart speakers and mi one microwaves, weirdly enough, as well, which is, uh, which is fun. So a lot of the stuff in here is, is, is kind of American data because essentially that's where most of the data is. And we'll find out probably a little bit about why that might be. Um, and later on, there's some data that shows where the, where the UK is in comparison to the US. And I think we're probably about nine months behind the US. So although these figures are for the US, they're still applicable in a general sense, I think, um, globally. So at the moment, the US has 66.4 million households that have a smart speaker. Voice, obviously, you're all kind of in this space to some degree or using the tools or building these tools. You'll be well aware that voice is far, far bigger and far, far more reaching than smart speakers. But in particular, looking specifically at smart speakers, which seems to be the thing that's driving a lot of this, 66.4 uh, million Americans have a smart speaker. That's 39%, nearly 40% year on year growth compared to last year. So what percentage of Americans have a smart speaker, do we think? 
just shout. A mathematician, 26%. Yeah. So what's interesting about that is that have you come across this kind of adoption cycle? I'm sure you've come across this adoption cycle before. Um, so the innovators tend to, the people who first grab hold of a technology or something end up becoming around about 8% of the, the market. The early adopters, typically we class the early adopters as around about 16% of the market. When you get over 25%, you're in the early majority stage of adoption. All this stuff comes from VoiceBot. AI, by the way. Is anyone familiar with VoiceBot? If you're not, check it out. It is, it is really, really good. The guy who does it is called Brett Kinsella. And in terms of voice, specifically voice industry data, market data like this, VoiceBot is the place to be for this stuff. So most of this comes out of their smart speaker consumer adoption report. Um, so in America, they are over the 25% uh, adoption rate. So they are into the early majority phase of this, of smart speakers in particular being adopted by, by American households. What about the UK? How many kind of smart speakers again specifically? How many uh, people in the UK do we think have a smart speaker? In their household. Yeah. How many households? Yeah. 15%. 15%. Any more than that? No, I don't, not more, I'm not trying, trying to uh, say that it is more, but anyone else. So there's 10 million active users per month. Now that's not necessarily the number of households that have a smart speaker, that's just the number of uh, users using smart speakers on a monthly basis in the UK. That is roughly about 15%. Could you help me write this? 15% more or less of the population is uh, using smart speakers on a monthly basis. That's more than own a pet rabbit. Who, and we can prove that now probably. So who has a smart speaker? Okay, quite a lot. Who has a pet rabbit? <laughs> the data doesn't lie, does it? Right, that, that puts us in the early adopter phase uh, of smart speakers in particular. Uh, so, this is how it looks like compared to other technologies that were adopted. Smart speakers in particular are the fastest growing consumer technology since the smartphone. It took the smartphone three years to reach 50 million users. <coughs> it's taken smart speakers two and a half years to reach 50 million users. So it is, it is growing well faster obviously than the TV. I think the aeroplane took us about sort of like 25 years or something to reach 60 million, uh, 50 million users. Smart speakers, in terms of the, the devices, it's growing faster than any uh, other consumer technology. I mentioned the market share at the beginning. This is the, the rough kind of market share in 2019 compared to 2018. So Amazon uh, has 60% of the market share with the Echo devices and Google 23.9. All the rest of them are in that 15%, the Apple HomePod and, and all of the other kind of um, uh, third party ones that have been created. So that's the devices. So on the devices, obviously we can do various things, can't we? We can do a lot of first party stuff, which is all of the built-in stuff in the device, setting your alarms, setting timers, all that kind of stuff. Or we can do third party stuff, which is all of the skills and the actions and all of the things, really the areas where everyone in this room and all of us can actually play and exist on the smart speaker platforms is in this kind of area. So this is looking at Alexa specifically, Alexa skill, uh, how many Alexa skills are there uh, in various countries? So in America, there's 57,000. In the UK, 30,000. Canada, 22. Australia is interesting because Amazon, I was speaking to somebody in Australia at uh, the Versa agency over the last few months, and Amazon didn't actually exist in Australia until last year, let alone smart speakers and Alexa and all that kind of stuff. But I suspect that's probably a lot of people who have made skills in the English language and have just published them in Australia. So I, don't, I can't necessarily say that that's Australian developers just grabbing hold of it and going crazy. So, interestingly, although there's a lot of skills available and there's a huge number of um, smart speakers that are being sold, it's being sold faster than smartphones ever have done, this is what people are actually using their smart speakers for, all right? So, at the very, very top, we've got asking it a question. So, out of, out of all of the people who ask it a question, 37%-ish uh, do it every day, 66% do it monthly. Behind that, you've got listening and streaming to music. Who listens to music on their smart speaker as their primary thing that they do with it? It's, it's quite a common 
thing that lots of people will essentially use it as an access to music and ve do very little else. Um, we've got setting a timer, that's obviously popular, setting an alarm is popular, but what's, where it starts getting interesting, at least I think, is the, uh, does this do a little, oh it does, cool, okay. So this bit here, using a favorite Alexa skill or action. This is, if it's a favorite skill or action, I would assume that that's something that people are coming back to, to use again, not just using it once. And there's 18% of people do that, who have a smart speaker do that every day. Playing a game or answer trivia, uh, listening to news and sports, uh, whereas it finding a recipe, listening to a podcast, all of that kind of stuff, because there's a lot of stuff in there that we can't do anything about, checking the weather, asking, uh, sorry, listening to music, listening to the radio, oh, actually you can probably do something about listening to the radio. Uh, <laughs> there's some things in there we can't do anything about because the first party things, but there's a lot of things in there that we can do something about, like asking, answering questions, uh, providing entertainment, games, uh, news and sports, all that kind of stuff. So that's one thing. On the other hand, that's, at the moment, that's kind of like painting quite a rosy picture, isn't it? You know, the, everything, you know, loads and loads of people are grabbing all of these devices and they're all asking the questions and playing music and isn't everything fantastic? And that's, you might hear quite a lot of that today. You might hear quite a lot of, I'm not saying that people are over egging it, but there is a lot of stuff happening like that where it's been really, really hyped and I've just spent the first five minutes of this hyping it up. <laughs> but the reality is actually that so according to this survey, again, this is the VoiceBot Consumer Adoption Report Survey, in terms of people who actually use those third party skills and actions, the things that we can actually do something about to get ourselves a presence and start taking advantage of those numbers, the people that actually use them, seemingly it's 50%. So 50% of people don't actually discover new voice apps. So all of those numbers around 15% you know, of the UK, uh, 10 million active users, you can pretty much half that if you want to find out what your addressable market is of people who actually use their smart speakers regularly. Um, but how, how, many people, how many people actually go through their phone and search for new apps on the phone? Yeah, one, two, okay. How many people use more than like five apps on their phone? Six apps, seven? Okay, so most people use about seven. So there's a lot of stuff around, you know, in voice and searching for this like killer app, like the thing that's going to come along and like revolutionize how people engage with smart speakers and voice because this is one thing that's going to come over and like just take over. The reality is we all use seven apps ish. Probably some of them are going to be fairly similar Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, maybe WhatsApp. You know, some of them are going to be fairly similar. Um, so we were having this discussion. Is anyone, is anyone in the, the Voice2 WhatsApp community group or not? No. Voice, I think it's voice2.io. If you go there, there's, there's a community of people who are all involved in this space and, and there's discussions happening all the time around this kind of stuff. And we were chatting in there the other day around, does there need to be this killer app? Does there need to be this one app that comes over and revolutionizes life? <laughs> the reality is probably not. You know, people don't go out and buy an iPhone because it's got Angry Birds on it. You know, even though that's a killer app, people might not go out and buy another phone specifically because they want to play Pokemon Go. You know, they're not, it's not that kind of a pull. So I think if you do hear stuff around, we're waiting for this killer app and there's going to be a killer app, it, that might be true. There might be big businesses built on these platforms in, in years' time. But at the moment, I don't really think that one killer app will do it. It's the, the, the real point is that this thing needs to just do its job and do its job well for people. Um, so. When I asked how many people actively search for apps on their smartphone, there was like one or two. I think you said you did, and there was a chap at the back that said you did. Um, so the reality actually is that 50% of people do look for new voice apps, which is overwhelmingly more than people do on smartphones. So it depends which way you look at it, really. Um, but one of the problems with uh, smart speakers and one of the challenges that everyone will face, and you may have come across this at the BBC, is discoverability. So finding out what's available on there, you know, when you don't have a screen to look at, you don't have options to choose from, it's very difficult to find out what these things can even do. So there's no wonder really that like 50% of people aren't searching for stuff. It's probably because they don't even know they exist. Probably don't even know that Alexa has skills and Google Assistant has actions and all that kind of stuff. Um, so there's some kind of education that needs to be done, I think, for, on, on everyone's behalf, is to educate your customers on what you can do with these things. Um, but interestingly, where, the, where there's a real opportunity, I think, is that most people ask it a question, right? So asking questions to smart speakers is a really common uh, thing to do. 
Um, and most people don't go and look for new skills and apps. So what uh, Amazon have done is they've released this can fulfill intent thing. It's a little bit of code really. And all it does is it sends people into a skill that it thinks can solve or answer the question that you're asking. So if you say, for example, I want to book a train, Alexa won't book you a train, it will probably put you into the train line skill and then from there you can book a train. And Google does this as well. So there's a chap called John Campbell, I don't know if he's here today or not, uh, from Rabbit and Pork. And what he found was that uh, Google, if you ask it a question like what's the, what's the uh, house price, average house price of a house in Coventry, for example, you ask it a question and more often than not it uses the internet to give you a result. So it'll go over to Google, it will see if it can find something in the search results and it'll bring back whatever's in those search results. What John did is he built a, an action on Google that specifically answered questions on house prices. And what Google started to do is it started to, when, when you were asking for the average house price in commentary, it started sending people into that action rather than reading results from the search page. So even though people aren't actively looking for voice apps necessarily, lots of people are asking questions. So if you can get yourself into a situation where you can answer those questions within the environment of these assistants, like in an action or a skill, then there's every chance that people will end up going into there rather than uh, being read a search result. And then from there, it's better for the user because they can have a purpose-built, specific experience that's, that's good for them. Uh, but then for you, you get to interact with them and have them in your skill, which means that you can, so one of the things that John was saying is that not only did he say, here's the average house price for a house in Coventry, you can also start learning what else people are asking. So people then started asking after that, they would say, what's the average house price in Manchester? What's the average house price in Los Angeles? So then he was able to then start suggesting stuff to people. So when someone comes into the action and says, what's the average house price in Manchester? You can say, do you want to know about the average house price in London? So you can start, because you can control the experience, you can get people into the skill of the action, you can then start to add more value and increase engagement. So. I suppose the point of that is that you can, you can chop these numbers any which way you can, but there's things happening behind the scenes that are, that are aiming to increase the discoverability of skills and actions, and that's the area and the environment that all of us will be uh, existing in if we choose to do this. So, interestingly, what happens when you have a smart speaker in your house and you use it is that you end up using your voice assistant on your smartphone more. Who is that true for people in here? Do you, have you found that you use your, your, your smartphone voice assistant more since you've had a smart speaker? Or not? Yeah. Yeah, uh, that's true for me as well. I mean, you know, I use it on my headphones and all sorts now. Um, and so this is looking at those that have a smart speaker, how often do they use their voice assistant on the smartphone? And nearly 40% do it daily. Does ever, does any, who uses the voice assistant on the smartphone every day? No? What about monthly? every now and then. Yeah, okay. Um, so yeah, about 70% of people uh, who were surveyed on this have used a voice assistant on a smartphone. But again, this is used a voice assistant on a smartphone. That's not necessarily use it every single day. So you can see, as, as these numbers start shaping together, you can see that there's potential, but it's still fairly early. This was put together by Google last year, and this shows that from people, it's the difference between what people do. Sorry, am I in the way there? It's the difference between what people do on a on the Google Assistant uh, device versus what they do on the Google Assistant on the Android. And more often than not, on Android, people are more interested in communicating and local stuff. So send X Y Z a text, and what time is X Y Z restaurant open till tonight, or whatever. Uh, in the home, on the smart speaker, they're more interested in productivity, set me a reminder to tell me to uh, put my bin out later on, uh, and media and news and weather. But the media and news one is quite interesting because within media you've got all kinds of things like games and, and stuff like that. So that's smart speakers and mobile phones, and then the emerging use cases are the car, that's, for, that's one. Um, so more people have actually, and again this is in America, but I think we can probably generalise, more people have used a voice assistant in their car than they have used a smart speaker. So the car is actually more common for people to use voice technology than these smart speakers that everyone's talking about. Uh, which is quite interesting. Did anybody see the Mercedes advert that was on as part of the Super Bowl? Yeah, a couple of nods. Essentially, if you didn't see it, it is, it's probably about 30 seconds to a minute worth of somebody kind of running around and there's all kinds of stuff happening and he's controlling everything outside of the car with his voice. 
and he gets in the car, he says something like Mercedes, play some music or whatever, and it plays. But the whole advert, you know, in the Super Bowl, one of the biggest advertising slots in the world, hundreds of millions of pounds are spent by companies to advertise in the Super Bowl. The whole advert from Mercedes was purely promoting the in-car voice assistant. So I think that's a sign of where things are at and how big brands are thinking about voice, is that they're, and, and, uh, uh, Amazon advertised uh, in the same spot with, with their kind of advertising. So it's reaching a point now, it's been parodied on you know, South Park and all that kind of stuff, it's reaching a point now where voice technology and speaking to stuff is becoming known and it's becoming not commonplace in terms of usage, but commonplace in terms of our understanding that we can do it. A company called Drive Time, they purely specialise in in-car voice experiences. So all these new environments that pop up, there's opportunities in there to craft specific stuff within each of these environments. And Drive Time is an example of that purpose-built company. And what they do essentially is it's a radio show, but it's an interactive radio show. So they'll do like polls and they'll do trivia quizzes and all that kind of stuff. And you can suggest songs and all that kind of stuff. And it's, it's an interactive radio show in the car. It's fantastic. Alexa Auto was released last year. Did anyone see that? Yeah, so that's essentially, so, you know, most of the, the car manufacturers are building in-car voice assistants. Uh, Alexa is in all kinds of new cars, like the, the new uh, Mercedes, the new BMWs. But for the cars that aren't new, which is the overwhelming majority of them, Amazon released this little thing, just this little thing you put on your dashboard here, and that allows you to hook up Alexa to your car stereo. So essentially, it's like, uh, updating the, the current uh, in-car stuff to include voice assistants. And that's essentially a way of, of, of Amazon getting into every car possible. And a way for us that might not have a brand new car with a voice assistant to have access to voice technology uh, within the car aside from the smartphone. Wearable stuff is the kind of, and this is kind of more recently, but headphones are being created now with Alexa and Google Assistant built in. So there's all kinds of new use cases that pop up when you put access to stuff into new environments. Obviously, that's the, ear, the, the AirPods. Uh, Bose have released one with uh, Alexa built in. There's a whole host of, of manufacturers have done that. So we're seeing voice go from the home, from the smart speakers in the home, to mobile, which is in the home and out of the home. And now we're seeing it entering new environments like the car and wearable uh, devices. Has anyone seen these Bose glasses? They, they were announced uh, at South by Southwest this last week, was it? Uh, essentially, he makes them look pretty cool. I've got a feeling that if I wore them, I'd look stupid. <laughs> but, but essentially, what they are, the reason why I want to talk about this is that uh, Earplay, they are one of the leading uh, creators of interactive voice experiences. They've done the Jurassic World skill. There's one called Mr. Robot. It is like movie quality production. Seriously, movie quality sound production and interactivity. It's more, it's long form interactive audio, essentially. But they are the, the, the global leaders in it. It's absolutely fantastic. Uh, we'll have them on the podcast on Monday if you want to check them out. What they've done with Bose is they have collaborated with Bose to create an... <laughs> I don't even know how to describe it. It's an interactive augmented reality audio experience through the glasses, <laughs> which is so weird. Because of the, the glasses, they've got this technology in them that is, um, it's like a geo-mapping thing. So you could put a sound over at that box and when you're wearing the glasses, you would walk over to this box and you start hearing the sound when you get close to it. And then you start walking away and the sound disappears and, and it recognizes movements. So the, the thing that they've done is so cool. It's almost like, it sounds, they wouldn't release too much information, but they did mention this on the podcast, so I think I can share this bit, is that, so the first bit when it opens up, it's like you're on a secret mission, and they say, you know, your mission, if you choose to accept it, don't talk because they can hear you, nod if you want to carry on. And when you nod, the glasses recognize that you're nodding, and then it'll carry on. So already we're seeing that this wearable technology, even it's obviously voice activated as well, but it's advancing beyond voice into gesture as well. So we're seeing a kind of convergence of all these kind of different technologies and voices part of that suite of technologies that opens up uh, lots of interesting opportunities. I said that we would do something, what time is it? How far, how far are we on? Okay, we're getting on, we're getting on. So do you want me to go over some stuff in terms of how you can think about voice or do you want me to show you some other examples of some new cases? Hands up for some of the more strategic stuff. Hands up for use cases. Okay, let's do use cases. Uh, <laughs> right, uh, yeah, okay. <clears throat> so, on the one hand, you've got pure audio use cases. 
This is ambient, laid back, leisurely uh, experiences. Tuning in is a prime example of that. BBC are here today, they, you, so you can just say, Alexa, play the BBC Radio 1, and it will dump you straight into the BBC skill and start playing Radio 1. In uh, America, there was another study that was done that said that in, 20, uh, no, in 2008, 22% of American households had a DAB digital radio. The same study was done last year, and 8% have. So 26% of American households have a smart speaker, only 8% have a digital radio. So smart speakers seemingly could be taking over where the radio was, and the leisurely laid back experiences are one part of that. And you know, tune in is another example. You can play podcasts on there, you can listen to radio stations on there. Stuff that is voice controlled, but once it's started and once it's playing, it's playing. It's just ambient in the background. Then you move into the kind of like interactive audio, and I mentioned Jurassic World. So what this is, is it's again, it's, it's literally movie quality sound, um, and it's an interactive experience for the launch of Jurassic World a few years back. Again, Earplay did this, and it's a long form interactive audio uh, story. So it's still a kind of lean back leisurely experience, but you, you're called upon to say stuff and to interact with it, to, to take the story in different directions. Uh, and this is another example on Google Assistant. This is Hidden Cities Berlin. It was put together as a collaboration by the Financial Times and Google, built by a company called Rosina Sound. We've had them on a the podcast, hence the uh, podcast image there. Um, so that's a, another, it's an interactive documentary. So it's actually, you know, all the things you hear are real documentary footage, but you determine what you listen to and how and what order. <clears throat> CBB is another BBC uh, example. Interactive audio, but probably more short form as opposed to long form. So uh, in the CBB skill, you can be read a short story or you can play a short game. And there's literally 30 seconds worth of uh, audio and then you'll need to make a decision. And depending on what the decision you make, it, it goes in different directions and stuff like that. Uh, there's a whole host of uh, interesting use cases around the older generation. So this company, Ask Marvi, they provide um, voice services for uh, older people and in residential care homes and stuff like that. And they can do things like text their uh, son or daughter, you know, put things on a shopping list. That shopping list is sent to the son and daughter. They can then go and do the shopping. And, and then it also in the residential homes, it allows them to interact with each other and for the residential home also to interact with them while they're in the rooms. <clears throat> it's a really, really interesting use case. But there's whole, loads of use cases around elderly and, and, and healthcare in general. There's a hospital in America that's released uh, echo devices into the uh, patient wards so that the patients can do things like close the blinds, turn on the telly and do all that kind of stuff so that the nurses aren't running around doing stuff that they could otherwise be doing something else more useful. Uh, this was a collaboration with Rain Agency, a large voice, specific voice agency in America. It was a collaboration with Nike. They launched a pair of trainers during a basketball game uh, in February. <clears throat> so essentially, at half time, you were asked to go to Google Assistant, interact with this, uh, this uh, experience, and at the end of it, some people won a free pair of trainers, other people went on and be sent to the place where they can buy the trainers. They actually launched the product through voice. Uh, this is the Bottle Genius. This is the in-store experience. All these lights here are all lit up, and then you ask uh, this, this Bottle Genius. It will take you through a guided question and answer and a guided experience to pick the right whiskey for you, tell you a little bit of facts about the whiskey, and as, you start, as it starts narrowing you down, the lights disappear. So at the end, you're left with a shelf, whole shelving unit. You've had the conversation experience. It's picked the right whiskey for you based on what you've said, and the whiskey that you want is lit up on the shelf. Fantastic in-store experience. Unilever have been working a lot with influencers and trying to merge uh, voice and social together. And they were, this is again Rain Agency. They tried a whole host of different ways to promote and discover skills, uh, like an email list that tried to get people back into the skill. It was like a morning routine thing. They trialed influencers, the Unilever influencers that they used to promote it. They had something like 12,000 people use it in an eight week trial period that they, that they launched it for. <clears throat> but the conversion rate in terms of people buying products wasn't that good. So it was about 2%, something like that. Um, so we're seeing a lot of experimentation happening. This is an example, Uma, it's an enterprise voice assistant that lets you book meeting rooms and take meeting notes and circulate actions and stuff like that. So a voice is also coming into the enterprise and into the workplace, fantastic uh, use case. Rabo Bank, that's a Dutch bank. You can check your bank balance, you can make bank transfers. Capital One, we've been doing that for quite a few years in America, but now this is available in Europe on Google Assistant. I don't know how to pronounce this, any German people in here? Yeah, do you know how to pronounce this? Right, I would love to repeat that, but I think I will offend all German people. But that's an insurance uh, company in Germany. You can actually take out an insurance policy with your voice 
in Germany. So well, essentially what we're seeing is, I'll skip through these last couple, what we're seeing is that <clears throat> the use cases for voice can be applied all over the place. It's not confined to smart speakers. It's, uh, the different environments bring about different opportunities. And the use cases and what I was showing you just then is an example of how people are experimenting. And what you'll see today really probably won't be a whole lot of we've got this complete thing boxed off. It'll probably be a whole lot of this is what we've done and this is what we've learned. And that's kind of the phase we're in now. So. Don't be fooled by the huge numbers and glorification because the reality probably is slightly different. However, there is huge, huge opportunities there. Um, <clears throat> and think about voice not from an Alexa or Google perspective. Think about it from a perspective of voice being an interface to technology and a conversation being a thing that you can have with your customers going forward. So that's pretty much it, really. Uh, I hope today goes well for you and i hope you enjoyed that little kind of setup just then and if anyone's got any questions or anything like that i'll be hanging around for an hour or so after this as well so do enjoy the day everyone Thank you. cheers